Hi, everyone. Welcome back. If you've joined us, you'll be um, coming back into the Zoom room. Um, we're here for Hope Revisited with Valerie Plush, Amar Azuz, and Tiffany Chung. I'm going to hand it off to Padma for this introduction. Great. Uh, welcome back, everyone, to our second session, uh, Hope Revisited. It's really my pleasure and delight to introduce uh, today's um, presenters. Uh, Amar Azuz is a UK-based architect and writer uh, who also works as an analyst at AREP and as a short-term research associate at the University of Oxford. He studied architecture in Syria and completed his PhD in the arch architecture at the University of Bath. Among his many accolades, he is also a member of the City Collective and has written and published in numerous international publications on such topics uh, as divided cities, local and international responses to destruction and displacement, and the politics of reconstruction. Uh, Valerie Plesch is an independent first-generation Vietnamese-Argentine-American photojournalist, documentary photographer, and writer based in Northern Virginia. She has reported from Kosovo and Afghanistan and is currently documenting the growing Afghan, Afghan community in the Washington, D.C. area, including the arrival of asylum seekers and refugees who fled Afghanistan. Tiffany Chung is internationally noted for her meticulously detailed cartographic work, works and mixed media installations consisting of hand-drawn and embroidered maps, paintings, photographs, sculptures, videos, archival materials, uh, and theater performances. Chung's work excavates layers and histories of traumatized topographies, uh, creating interventions into the spatial and political narratives produced through, this, through statecraft with cultural memories. In 2019, Chung presented a major solo exhibition at the Smithsonian American Art Museum uh, titled Tiffany Chung, Vietnam Past His Prologue. Uh, the first iteration of Chung's Syria project was featured in the 56th uh, Venice Biennale's central exhibition, All the World's Futures, with 40 map-based drawings in that chart Syria's ever-expanding cycles of violence and refugee displacement. There's much more I could say about everyone, uh, but with that, I'd love to hand it over to uh, Tiffany to start the discussion. Thanks, Pema, for the great introduction, and thank you to Asian Art Museum for having us here, and thank you to um, all of you for attending this um, symposium today. And I, when I was asked to um, organize this panel, I, I thought of Amaz and Valerie's work um, because each of their work is very inspiring and it speaks to the idea of hope um, to me, at least to me very clearly. So, you know, we're very excited to have them here and um, they will show and share more of their work uh, after this. But um, to begin with, um, I will also present a little bit of my work just to give the context to the panel of today. So I'm gonna be uh, sharing my screen now. Um, So um, for, I would say for two decades, um, but especially in the, in the last decade, uh, my research and interdisciplinary practice inquire into an interwoven complex framework of uh, social, political, economic, and environmental processes in countries impacted by war destruction um, and climate disaster. Uh, the notion of urgency is evident in my work that unpacks conflict, um, geopolitical partitioning, uh, spatial transformation, environmental crisis, um, displacement, and forced migration. Uh, the subtext that runs through all the work is about the fortitude and agency of people whose resilience and wisdom inspire hope. Uh, personally, I experienced a historic flood in the Mekong Delta that was recorded in the International uh, Disaster Database in 1978. 
Um, so I'm very interested in flooding as something natural and as um, indicative of Anthropocene disasters, uh, particularly floods which have been intensified by hydropower development in the Mekong River and with uh, sea level rise due to climate change. Uh, for this, I have proposed a floating village model um, that combines uh, vernacular architectural forms of uh, farming and houseboat communities in Asia as a sub sustainable way of living with uh, chronic floods. And I'm also invested in the potential outreach of art as a form of political imagination and participation. Uh, part of my work is to reclaim the narrative through revisiting and intervening history with people's remembrance as the way forward. Uh, my field work in Hong Kong between 2015 and 2018 uh, focused on former Vietnamese refugees that were resettled in Hong Kong. Now, Hong Kong is a port of first asylum. It's, it was a, a place of transit that somehow turned into a permanent home. Um, so with their experience of growing up in detention and organizing protests against deportation, um, you know, I was able to learn a lot from that. And then with, together with materials that I collected from the UNHCR uh, in Geneva and from other sources, I put together three panel discussions um, participated by uh, Hong Kong-based human rights lawyers, um, these former refugees and uh, representatives of Trampoline House, a refugee community center in Denmark. The panel, the panel discussions discussed the refugees' experiences in relation to asylum policies and the potential changes that can improve uh, refugees' conditions in host countries. And so contributing to such conversations really shifted the Vietnamese refugees' victim position to one with agency and brings new meanings to the trauma that they had to go through. Um, my remapping of the Vietnamese refugee migration trajectory point to Africa, um, the Middle East, and Latin America as destinations, decentering the established narrative um, of refugees only being assisted by Western countries. And similarly, my tracking of uh, the Syrians' displacement focuses on the Middle East region to challenge the notion of this refugee migration being framed as a, a European refugee crisis. Um, I have also conducted map making workshops with, um, let me, I think I have to go back. Yeah, so I've also conducted map making workshops with uh, young refugees in Denmark um, in a program called Traveling with Art, an education program initiated by Louisiana Museum of Modern Art and the Danish Red Cross schools that kind of facilitates a space for these youngsters to practice uh, reflecting and focusing which I think very crucial for them to regain hope and direction in life. Um, so the, this is the work that I've done. And yeah, so I did it for two years, 2016 and 2017. And um, when I came back to Vietnam, I also co-founded Sand Art, an, in, an independent art space in Saigon that aims to nurture the local art community and uh, connect them to a global, a more like global audience. Um, so I collaborated with a group of young artists in Saigon to facilitate an exploration of learning the erased Viet history of the Vietnam um, refugee exodus uh, through a series of paintings. 
And most recently during the pandemic, I worked with my former professor Kim Yasuda to conceive and carry out an academic alternative program at UC Santa Barbara. Um, it's called Agency Urgency Learning with the Global South. This program uh, draws upon the imagination and agency of artists in social and political changes by having dialogues with and around various decolonizing uh, strategies in, embedded in the practices of artists and curator from the global south. Um, I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to um, just, you know, stop my presentation here. Um, Amma, I, I remember we, you know, we talk a bit about this, but you are writing about, um, you know, the a book that part of it discusses how communities inside and outside of Syria respond to the destruction of the country and the debate um, shaping the future of reconstru reconstruction in Syria. So I, I find this, prop, uh, this project very profound um, and I am looking forward to hearing more about it today. And after that, uh, Valerie will share her photo documentary work, which reminds us that Afghanistan is not just a war zone, but a country with beautiful people and culture. So that's why I really appreciate your work. So I will hand over the screen to Amar. Welcome. Thank you very much uh, for the organizers for putting this wonderful program together, especially as many of us are having the darkest times uh, in this uh, pandemic and many other challenges. So it's nice to, to revisit hope and to come back to the question of hope and how to reconstruct it uh, in these moments. And just to, um, I have some slides that I want to share, but just to say how I uh, met with Tiffany. I'm a Syrian person who is based in the UK, in London. I left my country, my, uh, uh, I left the war in Syria in 2011 in November. So exactly 10 years ago, next month will be, um, this month actually will be uh, 10 years uh, since I left and I never returned. And throughout the last uh, decade, we have seen the work of uh, different artists um, looking at the questions of uh, uh, displacement and destruction. And what struck me and what, uh, what was really moving and touching is to see the work of Tiffany, uh, looking at the maps of uh, Syria. And I got in touch with Tiffany um, and it was just humbling to, to be in touch and to have this, this conversation and to have a sense of solidarity um, and the overlaps be between the questions that Tiffany is raising and, and myself. So I'm going to share my screen now. So um, I share now the first slide, uh, which is on hope revisited. And I'll, I start uh, the presentation with uh, uh, the photo in black and white of um, famous uh, Syrian activist and actress, uh, Fadwa Suleiman, which I will come back to, to hear more at the end of the presentation. So my name is Ammar Azouz. Um, I'm, I'm based in London, as I said. Um, and I'll be uh, sharing with you some slides about my work and why we need to, to reconstruct hope uh, today. I'm sorry, but just uh, need to turn on the lights just a second. Yeah. So for those who aren't familiar with the region, I always like to put um, a map of Syria where Syria is. So it's in between uh, many conflicted areas. So we had Lebanon on the left where you, you had the civil war, we have Iraq on the right, and there's uh, the, the, the struggle in Palestine and Israel, uh, the conflict, and there's Kurdistan. And um, uh, so there are a lot of divisions, struggles and conflicts. There's Cyp Cyprus with divisions. And our country, since 2011, there was a revolution that led um, to, uh, to a catastrophe and a tragedy. Uh, when people went to the streets, um, hoping for uh, an alternative future, hoping for a change, for freedom and justice and dignity. But all these hopes have been crushed when people marched in the streets uh, and the government stopped them, um, killing people, arresting people, um, uh, which turned now into uh, the Syrian catastrophe. 
that we hear all over the world. My own uh, focus is on my city, Homs, uh, which you can see on the map on the right um, in, in the, in the uh, uh, dotted line. Um, and also you can see on the left. And uh, just a, a tiny bit of um, information about the, the struggle in Syria. So everything started, the revolution started as part of the wider Arab Spring that spread across many countries in the region, uh, North Africa and the Levant, the Middle East. Um, the uprising in Syria started in March uh, 2011. So exactly this year in 2021, uh, we mark a first decade of struggle. Um, and until now, until today, uh, the conflict continues. The country is extremely divided. The communities are extremely divided. Uh, over half a million people have been killed in the last decade. Uh, millions of people have been displaced from their homes. Uh, so over half of the population is now outside of their homes, uh, including over 6 million uh, people who are internally displaced people, uh, or as known as IDPs, and also people who cross the borders, uh, which could be migrants, refugees, asylum seekers um, across the world, such as in Lebanon, in Turkey, in Jordan. So I wanted to put this slide just to show the scale um, of the, uh, the catastrophe in Syria, and just to show you a little bit for those who aren't familiar with uh, the region, uh, a glimpse of um, some of the figures and the numbers surrounding the conflict. Uh, my own city, Homs, um, many of the neighborhood, neighborhoods have been raised to the ground completely, um, creating um, uh, a ghost town in, in, in the city, creating uh, a lot of destruction inside the city. It is hard today after a decade of destruction and a decade of mass displacement, it is really hard to, um, to maintain hope and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very easy to, uh, to get into the loss of hope at the time of destruction. How can we make sense of this uh, catastrophe? Uh, how can we understand the, the conflict beyond uh, uh, the one-off uh, uh, image of destruction? Uh, in my conversations with Tiffany and uh, Valerie, we, we spoke about how wars and conflicts uh, start as headlines in the news. Um, giant headlines in the news, and then how they become uh, slowly um, um, and, uh, forgotten, how the wars become faceless, and uh, how they can also fade away. Uh, so in Syria, for instance, we have seen it many times as a headline on the struggle, on the displacement, on the, um, uh, on the lines of migrancy across Europe, and uh, the lines of migrancy and displacement to Jordan and other countries but now it's almost an, a forgotten war. At the time of this chaos and destruction, what can we do to reconstruct the sense of hope? And how can we come back to the hope that brought people to the streets to ask for a change, to ask for a, a better future? Uh, how can we maintain that hope, especially at the time where the history is being erased, where the architecture is being erased, uh, where the, the way of living is being, uh, is being destroyed. And I think um, one of the, the things that we always hear about wars and conflicts is the ruins. We hear about, we see the ruins, we see the aftermath of the destruction, but we don't, we don't see the, the life in these spaces, the urban life in the city, we don't see how these cities have, have been before the conflict. So I always, when I speak about Homs, when I speak about Syria, I always love to, uh, to put uh, images of, of the city before the war, uh, which I took into uh, 2009 and 2010. So you can see, for instance, the, the green field surrounding the city in the bottom left. And you can see in the top right, some people praying on Friday prayer in the street near a tiny mosque. And you can see the a black wall on the left uh, with some arches, which is part of the, um, the historical site of the city uh, of Homs, the old city. And in the bottom uh, right, you can see the city council, uh, the, city, uh, the city center of Homs. So the question that I always try to ask in my um, research, and as uh, Tiffany said that I'm also writing now my, uh, my first academic book for Bloomsbury, 
um, is how can we uh, reconstruct that memory that has been uh, destroyed? And I think maybe one of the questions that we can raise today in the conversation is how to tell the story about the conflict? Um, who has the right to tell the, the story about the conflict and what stories uh, we choose uh, to tell what stories have the chance to be told and how can we unfold, um, how could the stories of uh, different voices uh, become to, the, uh, to be known to, to the uh, people, to the, to the global audiences. And to focus, because today's um, uh, webinar uh, is about hope, I chose to, to select one site inside my city that has turned into a site of hope. And this site, as we have seen in, in the global unrest that we have seen in the last decade, in whereas it is the Black Lives Matter, whereas it is the Arab Spring in the city, whereas it's the Hong Kong uh, um, um, demonstrations, the public space become the site of resistance. They become um, the, the sites of uh, rebellion and they become the platforms for people to come to the street, to the squares, chanting for their uh, rights, chanting for their hopes and dreams. And in my own city, different streets and different neighborhoods, different squares have become also the sites for protest, peaceful protest. But one symbolic moment was this specific site, which has a clock tower at the heart of it called the new clock tower. And the square, it has a, 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 a name, but it, it became known uh, to the people as the a new clock tower that has turned into a symbol of hope. And why it did turn into a symbol of hope? Because when the, when the struggle in Syria, when the revolution started in 2011, uh, a massive uh, sit-in has been organized there in April, um, um, in April 20, 2011. And that uh, sit-in was faced with brutality and with violence by the government. Um, where many people were killed on that night, um, and therefore the site has become associated with the revolution because it was the site where people gathered together to say uh, one, one word, one, the Syrian people is one. So uh, calling for unity, calling for justice and freedom, but also because these hopes have been, uh, have, uh, have been crushed the site has also become the site of trauma and the site of a massacre, but it's also known to many um, people in the city as um, the massacre of the new clock tower square. The city itself as Homs, uh, which uh, also Tif uh, Tiffany has done quite a lot of research on Homs and on many other uh, spaces in, in Syria has become to be known as the capital of the revolution. So not only this site has become very significant, in the imagination of people's mind within Homs, but also outside Homs, but also the city itself as a collective, it has become as a symbol of the revolution, as a capital of the revolution, where people started um, to, uh, to stand in solidarity with the people of Homs uh, inside and outside Syria. And just a tiny bit of history of this clock tower, it has been built um, after a donation of uh, a, a Homsi um, lady who was um, a woman from Homs who was uh, a migrant in, in, uh, in history uh, to Brazil. And she donated uh, the fund to build this clock tower. And I think it was completed in 1960s. So the site itself has a history. It has a meaning in the people's mind, but also in revolutions when you have wars and struggles and conflicts, specific sites turn into, uh, become to be associated with different layers of meaning and understanding, such as um, the memory of the sitting, the memory of the revolution, and the memory of um, the rebellion. I think many of us now today, um, inside or outside Syria, who have been um, impacted by the conflict and displacement, uh, we feel um, that we have a moral obligation to do something about remembering hope. And I think very often in, in conflicts and wars, in the tragedy of the war, we forget to remember the hope. And I think the question that we, we hope 
I hope to ask today and to engage with you in the conversation is how can we fight to remember this hope? And I think the artwork, such as the work of Tiffany, such as the work of many artists across the world, could help us to remember hope. But also writing is another way to, to fight this um, um, destruction of memory. And, and I hear what like a snapshot of an article has been written by um, um, a, a person from my city, from Homs, who is based in Turkey, who has written exactly about the time where the massacre took place in, in this uh, city, uh, in this square, and how important it is. He has uh, written uh, this piece in 2020, but how important for us to pull out pieces of history, to pull out certain events, and to bring them to the consciousness of the people and to bring uh, the memory of the site to the consciousness that we don't forget what happened, we don't forget the hope that brought people to the street. So writing is one of the tools that help us to fight um, um, uh, the destruction of memory. And just to show you the symbolism of the site, the clock tower, it hasn't been only important for people inside homes, but also what I found really deeply moving and uh, touching is to see that people inside refugee camps, so you can see in this image, you can see tents um, inside a refugee camp um, in Greece, where many refugees have used, um, have reached Greece as a point to, to move across different countries in Europe, but how people have rebuilt a replica of this clock tower um, as a way to rebuild the symbol of hope. So for me, I found this, it has a different layers of meaning because first it's, a, it's a, a, a symbol of the city of Homs. So definitely it's a way to reconstruct a sense of home uh, when everything around the refugees is shaking, but it's also uh, a moment to remember hope that brought people to the street and led them um, um, to displacement and led to, to all the struggles that we have been facing in the last 10 years. Now, memory um, um, in the city is sometimes uh, forced on us by people in power. And I'm putting here this another square um, inside the city center of homes to show you how new memorials emerge now inside homes. So to put things in context, I'll explain a little bit more on this specific square. So now, after 10 years of struggle inside Syria, um, in my own city, more than half of the neighborhoods have been heavily destroyed. So over 50% um, of the neighborhoods are destroyed. Um, the city is still in ruins today after um, 10 years of uh, destruction. Um, millions of people are still displaced. But the government is making efforts to, to build the new monuments and new memorials that they are one-sided and focused on the military, on the military of the government. So here we see in the site that was the site where people marched to ask for um, rights and freedom and justice is becoming contested, and the new memorial is built by the government to show on who has the right to be remembered in the city, who owns the site here, and, um, and also at the same time, these monuments and these memorials could be dividing, and they are dividing people because they don't give the space for public mourning. They don't give the space for the civilians who have been killed to be remembered publicly in a space. So what I wanted to put here that in the moment of chaos and wars, history is being rewritten. And there is so much an important need for us to fight the rewriting of history and to focus on the memory of the struggle in the, in the face of whitewashing the pain of the people. Lastly, this is my last slide and I finish. I just uh, want to focus on, on this slide on the activists that I started with um, this presentation with her uh, photo, uh, Fadwa Suleiman, who was born in 1970 uh, and died in her exile in Paris in 2017. Uh, she has been one of the people who has been extremely active um, in the struggle inside the homes. Uh, she has given up her uh, career as an actress. Uh, she didn't bend 
uh, and kept herself silent to keep uh, to protect her privilege, to protect her career. She has sacrificed everything for the cause of the revolution, and she has always pushed for unity, for freedoms, for justice. And she always, even at the darkest times in her exile, she always remembered that we have to to keep hope in our mind. We have to never forget um, the the beauty that people brought with them to the streets, the struggles that they brought to the streets. And I would like to end up with this quote that she said here, um, that even if they erase everything, we should not let them erase our dream. If there's only one Syrian left, I am sure he, I would add she, uh, he and she will build the Syria that we love. Syria is not a country, a geography, it's an idea. And I think uh, for me here, I would just like to stop at this quote and uh, uh, I'm really looking forward to you, uh, to hear your thoughts, to, to hear your questions and uh, to engage with you and to listen to Valerie. Thank you so much. You are on mute, Tiffany. Hi, Valerie. Um, Hi, Tiffany. Please, yeah, please start your presentation. Thanks, Amara. Great. Um, one second. Okay. Okay, it's up. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, well, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here among this group. Um, it's very inspiring and um, the work that Tiffany and Amar are doing is um, it's really astounding and um, powerful and inspirational. Um, I come from a very different, uh, kind of a different background. I am a photographer. Um, I'm an independent photojournalist and documentary photographer. So I, um, I, I'm not creating art, but I'm, I'm documenting, uh, you know, news events, but putting them, uh, you know, putting a human face to these big events that um, uh, right now is, is the Afghan um, evacuation. So, um, but just to give a little background, I have always been drawn to the country of Afghanistan since I was a child. And I was just thinking recently that um, the last four decades of civil war and instability in Afghanistan is basically my own lifetime. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's a country that has suffered so much, um, but the people are so resilient. And I have gone to Afghanistan many times um, over the last uh, 14, 15 years. And um, in my previous career doing international development and then as later as a journalist. And it's to meet people, everyday people, um, not just in Kabul, the capital, but in other parts of the country. And it's, you know, so many things that we just don't see um, in everyday news and headlines. Um, so um, yeah, but, um, in this past year, um, I have been documenting the arrival of asylum seekers um, from Afghanistan just before the Taliban takeover. So even earlier this year, even towards the end of last year, uh, people knew that things were looking grim in, in Afghanistan and the future was very uncertain. Um, so I started documenting uh, a young woman who have come to Afghan to United States to restart their lives. They they fled Afghanistan. They were threatened by the Taliban, and I followed a few of them over these last um, many months. And then, of course, um, when the Taliban did take over um, in on August sixteenth, there was a mass evacuation, and um, many many um, Afghans are resettling here in my own community here in Northern Virginia. It's a huge um, diaspora, um, Afghan diaspora, and these new arrivals are certainly going to add to, to this vibrant community here. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'm just go through my pictures of, you know, some of the um, 
families that I've covered and documented for some stories here um, have come in the last few years and then they, um, and then asylum seekers. So, you know, like this woman, she was a very famous and prominent journalist in Afghanistan and she was put on a um, hit list um, at the end of last year, a Taliban hit list and um, found the way, her own way to come to United States and is currently seeking asylum. Afghan women who have come here and, and um, their hope was to go to school. And this woman never really had that chance growing up. She was able to find her way to go to, to finish her school and university, got a lot of pushback from her family. And she just graduated from Georgetown University a few months ago and is starting Columbia, at Columbia um, now in her master's program. I've just been really um, taken aback by also how active the community has been. Um, before the takeover, there were a lot of protests happening at the White House um, where the Afghan community was coming out. And these are, you know, uh, the Afghans who came um, from, you know, 40 years ago, 20 years ago, and uh, recent months were gathering together to stand for their country and um, over the summer and up to just a few weeks ago, they were still protesting. And that was really remarkable to see um, the community come together. Many told me that they had never seen that before, that, their, that the Afghan community just was not, um, had, had not done that before um, in this way. And, even women who, were, who never protested in their lives in Afghanistan were out here in the White House. And um, that was really remarkable to see. And you know, also even asylum seekers who had just come were protesting um, in front of the White House against what was happening in their country. Afghan women were very vocal. They were, in, for many of the protests, even organizing these protests. These people, they don't want, they are not giving up. They want to see a bright, a better future for their country. They do want to, some don't do want to go back to Afghanistan. They have not lost hope, but they know that they can still do good things for their homeland, even from United States. Many of them have told me this. This woman just came right after the Taliban takeover on one of those evacuation flights. This was the day of the takeover. Um, the Afghan community gathered in front of the White House. It was uh, a big, a big gathering. Um, so I just thought I could end it with this slide. Um, these are um, young women who had come in the recent, um, just a few years ago, but they still have families in Afghanistan. They have not forgotten their homeland, even though they're starting their new lives here and a new chapter in their lives. And they know it's better here for them. They are still fighting for a better future um, in Afghanistan and uh, they have not forgotten and they will use their voices here to keep fighting for their, for their country and the peace and um, yeah, not giving up. Um, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Valerie. It's so inspiring to see your photos. Um, this is exactly what I said uh, when I invited you to join the panel mm -hmm. because I really loved um, your documentation of ordinary uh, Afghans when you were when you were based there, when you reported from there. 
And also uh, later on, when I follow your work, uh, when you documented these, or you still documenting mm -hmm. the activists in DC. Um, right. And yeah, I, I really, you know, from experience and also from working with different communities, I realized that, you know, uh, communities that went through conflict they or in exile, they don't forget. Um, but as Ama um, brought it up earlier and during our conversation as well, that you know, many conflicts and injustices around the world um, have become footnotes in history, right? And all the headlines and all the stories fade away in the public consciousness. Why? War is still raging on, right? In the case of Syria and Afghanistan, the moment um, the US withdrew from Afghanistan, people just forgot about Syria. And it's, it's very um, interesting to see that. And also it's, a, it's really an important reminder of you know, how to reactivate right, memories in the public consciousness and um, I'm very glad to hear when uh, Amma was talking about kind of reminding people of these memories, but not just only of conflict and, and horrific memories, but also the memories of hope. So um, it goes hand in hand, I think, right? And then a few days ago, I listened on NPR, um, uh, Jane Goodall's interview uh, for her, the book that she just published called The Book of Hope. And what she said was um, any discussion of hope would be incomplete without admitting the horrible harm that uh, we have inflicted on the natural world and addressing the real pain and suffering people are feeling as they witness the enormous losses that are occurring. So, so I guess, you know, acts of remembrance can call for accountability. Uh, and that's the only way that you can pave the way for people to move forward. And, uh, and then we talk about remembrance, right? And versus public uh, memorials and amnesia, who get to tell the story? So I guess the question is, how do we reclaim the narrative from power, from the grand history, like you were talking about public memorial in in Afghan, in Syria, where you know the government has the right and the resources resources to build this one sided public memorial. So how do um, ordinary people like ourselves to to contribute to reclaim the narrative and you know to reactivate the these memories, including the memory of hope. Thanks a lot for this, Stephanie. I think one of the, the answers is exactly what uh, you and Valerie are doing. I think uh, art and culture and photography, they can really become as tools of preserving and protecting the, the history, protecting the memory. So for instance, through artwork, we can tell the story through art, uh, you can sum up the struggles of many, many people uh, in the work of the artwork and also throughout the, the, the photography that uh, uh, Valeria is a photojournalist, as uh, I understand, but also the people on the ground who are taking their mobile phones and documenting what's happening. Because in many cases, when you have uh, a conflict in the name of reconstruction, everything is being swept under the rug as if pretending nothing has happened. Uh, and in that way, the history is being buried and the history is being erased again in the name of reconstruction. So I think um, uh, the, the artwork is, is definitely crucial to make sense of the tragedy by local and international artists who are reflecting on a certain conflict, but also the photography when people are taking, um, um, we see what they term as the, the citizen journalist, people are going to the street to write and report what's happening especially in situations where international journalists are not permitted to go to, to countries like in Syria. But I think there's a lot of need to document through mapping, through writing, uh, documenting, undertaking research. And in that sense, it's, it's definitely no one's uh, uh, individual work. It should be a movement 
when people are making a collective work, putting hands and hands together to work on protecting what remains in, in the history inside Syria. I wonder, Valerie, do you want to add on this? Yeah, no, I agree. And I just also, I mean, just thinking of these women who have just um, arrived here in the last few months, and I'm actually doing a story right now about um, a group of activists that have stayed together from the evacuation, um, fled together. There were friends in Afghanistan, they were able to evacuate together, and now they're starting their own lives here in Virginia together, but um, they need support. They need resources to keep telling um, the stories from Afghanistan. They're the ones who are still connected to um, other activists still on the ground who could not leave. And they are a vital link um, for, I think for us to see, um, you know, from their perspectives and, uh, yeah, so I, I, I do think, um, you know, if the communities that they live in can support them with this and giving them a platform to um, continue to share their, their stories and, 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 and their own work, um, I think right now is, is really critical because they're able to do that safely from here. Yeah. So there's a question from the audience that I thought um, quite interesting. So. Um, I'm going to read this. How has the loss of home affected refugees in their new countries? And do you believe that this forced creation of diversity in new communities will lead to a new understanding or policies in these countries? Hmm. Can I jump in here? I, I think this is something um, extremely important to think about because many people think that when refugees arrive to the comfort of cities, let's say as Toronto or Berlin or Amman or Beirut, that this is the end of the struggle. And many people think that once you arrive to the safety shores, um, to, the, to the new home, that everything is, is now fine. And I think there's so much to do with the griefing, there's so much to do with the trauma, there's so much to do with the loss. Um, um, and the morning from people who have left, who are living in the comfort of cities, but have carried with them the pain of loss. And this is where uh, the terms as the, the word that I'm working and engaging with called domicide, which is the killing of domus or the killing of home. It's not only the loss of the tangible home that many people have lost in the time of war, but it's also the destruction of the way of living, uh, the destruction of the community, and the, uh, the, the, grief, um, the grief syndrome that many people would have um, in reflection to this trauma. So their pain carries on. And many of them, um, I'm talking about myself, for instance, I'm living in the comfort of one of the richest and most diverse maybe countries in the world. I still carry with me a sense of homelessness, even though I feel I'm extremely privileged person, but I'm still, struggling with uh, these notions of this forced displacement and the trauma of it. And we also, especially for us who leave our families behind, we always compare our life with the people we left behind. Why am I more privileged than them? I feel guilty. I cannot even enjoy having a cup of coffee inside a cafe because I know the people in, inside my country are struggling in many different ways. So there is that personal individual tragedy that we, we lose our home, that we, we carry with us in our exile. But there is also the sense of belonging to a collective struggle as a collective griefing to a society that has lost so much. And this carries on when we take ourselves to live in the sanctuary of new homes, that grief and that pain continue with us. Uh, so that's just like to answer the first part of the question, but I. I would like to also see if Valerie wants to engage with this. Yeah, that really resonates with me. I mean, actually within my own Vietnamese community, my family, my grandparents and uh, other family members were refugees from Vietnam. But I, I've seen even here, <laughs> even within the Vietnamese community, how from pain and trauma from the war that ended, um, 
almost uh, 50 years ago has carried on till today. And with um, not just with the older generation, but it gets passed down to the younger generation. And I've, I've seen this um, up close and, and uh, but if for sure, the, um, I know the Afghans that have, have been uprooted, their lives have been just completely uprooted um, so quickly. They are, are, they are going through this, but um, I think, you know, if they have a community that can support each other, um, I, you know, it will help them tremendously. And um, yeah, not to forget what's happening in our country. Yeah, and I think a lot of refugees in exile, um, not only contributing to the ongoing struggle or resistance of those who are still back in the home country, but they also have to uh, reconstruct a sense of home for, for themselves in the new countries mm -hmm. and also provide that sense of home for people, you know, still, I mean, in the country as well. Because if you look at Syria, like look at all the destruction, all the homes that got ruined, not just uh, public spaces, but everyone's homes, um, every day you pass through a corner, you can barely recognize it. So for people who are still staying in the country, they, they still have to continue to reconstruct that sense of home. So I think that's why it's so important that uh, artists, you know, journalists and, and academics uh, continue to kind of highlight and continue to you know, bring back and remind people that there's still a lot of work to be done. So it's not really just up to the refugees to, to rebuild and to change policies, but I think it's for all of us because what the pandemic really showed us is that things just happen across the world, right? I think at the beginning, I thought, oh, it's only happened in Asia. The next thing I knew it hit the US and you know, nowhere is safe. So if you know that, if we know that, um, everyone could be refugees the next day, the next morning. Um, and I think that's just everyone's responsibility, um, thinking about how to change policy and, and what to do to help. So we, you know, when talking about policy is a big grand thing, but it's also a lot of organization just simply hold the hands of every newcomer. Um, and I think that, that is just the effort that all of us um, need to put in. So thank you for, you know, for being part of the panel discussion, although short, but I think it's quite meaningful. So I'm gonna let the host of the symposium to um, do the final remark. Thank you so much, Valerie, Tiffany, Amar. It's been a pleasure to have you here to talk about um, all these topics. Um, we are going to take a short break. Um, we will return at around 10 a.m. for our next panel, which is titled, I haven't memorized it because it's very long, a language where yesterday and tomorrow are the same word call. So we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you so much. <laughs>